Thank you for reading that the way I wrote that, Maxie. I appreciate that. <laughs> it has been a real joy in my life over the last eight years to be associated with Maxie and the other workers that he mentioned. I feel very blessed and grateful to God that I've been afforded that opportunity. Let me encourage you to come to the Truth in Love luncheon at noon today. We'll meet uh, to eat in the multipurpose room. If you go eat elsewhere, if you'll just come into this auditorium at 1240, 1230 to 1240, we'll give a very brief report, Johnny and I will, and we would appreciate your presence uh, at that time. I wanted to ask our School of Preaching students to stand if you're not aware of, uh, of how they look. Uh, we just wanted you to get a look at them. Thank you, gentlemen. We now have, uh, if my count is correct, 28. We just graduated uh, seven from the school in December, and we have 28 enrolled uh, this quarter. And we're very grateful for these men, good quality men. We're glad that they're studying with us. And we're grateful for you and for your presence during this lectureship. We've certainly heard some good preaching from some very capable, good Christian men. It's just been thrilling and uplifting and upbuilding as I know you feel the same way. I read over Gary Adams' manuscript yesterday and felt that it would be worth our time to draw many of his thoughts uh, from his manuscript, not only because they're good thoughts taken from the Word of God, but also in tribute to him, and we're so sorry that he is no doubt facing the end of his life very near. And then I'd like to sprinkle in some other thoughts as we proceed through this study. The study has to do with the responsibility that all of us have, especially us Christian men, to be busy, to be active. I wonder if you were to sit down with a pencil and paper and write on a piece of paper, what is my life about? What do I do with my life every day? What am I supposed to be doing as a Christian? That's what this study is about. Maxie designed this to be a very practical study in terms of emphasizing and impressing upon all of us that as Christians there is a work to do. We're supposed to be busy. We're only going to be here a certain period of time, and that's certainly unpredictable. And even if we live uh, a great deal of time in terms of human years, it's very brief. And so there is an urgency projected in the Bible after we are baptized that should translate itself into very active behavior, action, that God wants us to be involved in. And so we want to try to examine this matter as best we can. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we're familiar with 8 and 9, but in verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That passage summarizes the fact that once we become a Christian, once we have been privileged to enjoy and to be recipients of the grace of God, as saved individuals, we have works to do. That's why we were saved. That's why we're, we were created in Christ Jesus. There is, there is a work to be done. We need to get busy then. And then he talks about, uh, Ephesians has a lot to say about this, and so much of our lectureship is centered on this, but turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, where so much is said along this line. Uh, we typically think of the center of this book as being Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And so in the first three chapters, we have enumerated for us all kinds of things that God has done for us. These spiritual blessings, chapter 1, verse 3, that we've been blessed with salvation and the blood of Christ and remission of sins and on and on the three chapters go until you come in chapter 4 verse 1 therefore we need to walk worthy of our call isn't it interesting that all of the theoretical information given to us in the Bible if you want to use that term to describe what God has done for us you know all of this heavy information about the nature of sin the nature of God's justice God's wrath the necessity of atonement propitiation, the need for blood, all of these, you know, heavy things. Every time you read about that in the Bible, the reason for telling us about this is to then cause us to be changed, to live differently, to be prepared for eternity. 
And so after he articulates all of these things in the first three chapters, he says in chapter 4, Therefore, I beg you, I urge you, I plead with you to walk worthy of your calling. Live as a Christian should. That's what this life is about then. And in chapter 4, after going through these, these seven ones that are so profound and so central to what Christianity is about, and then talks about how, how Christ has gave these gifts in the first century to enable the church to be set up and so forth until, verse 13, we could come to the unity of the faith. All of Scripture could be laid out there and the totality provided for the human race. Then notice how practical things get. He says, for example, in verse 17, we're not to to live like we used to live. Uh, With hardened hearts, darkened understanding, alienated from God, past feeling. Involved in uncleanness and greediness, licentiousness. Verse 19. What are we to do then? Verse 22. Put off that former conduct and be renewed. Verse 23. In righteousness and true holiness. Verse 24. Well, what does that mean? 25. We're not going to lie anymore. That's practical, isn't it? We're not going to lie. We're going to speak the truth to people. Uh, We're going to, when we become angry, we're going to do it in such a way that we do not sin. By the way, that's a quotation of Psalm 4.4. We are going to, uh, look at verse 28. We're no longer going to steal from people. Rather, we are going to labor. Now, this to me, this is a fantastic passage. Everybody out here in the United States are working their heads off. Many people in our society right now are working a lot more than 40 hours a week. Why? Why are they doing that? And of course the answer to that is <laughs> to, get, to get things. They're, they're buying cars and clothes and houses and, and uh, involving themselves in all kinds of pleasures and leisure activities. That's why they're doing it. The Bible doesn't, certainly the Bible teaches Christians are to work. But that's not why. Why are Christians to work? He says, so that we may have something to give to him who has need. Man, isn't that something? You mean when I'm working on the job 8 to 5, I'm doing that so I can help other people? That's not just to accumulate and amass for myself like that rich man who said, you know, I've got so much, I'm going to tear down these barns and build more. I mean, his life was centered on himself. And we could stop right here and cover the subject. That's it. Christians, when we come from the waters of baptism, are supposed to turn outward and start doing for other people. We're to focus our lives upon giving assistance to other people. And therefore, essentially, everything we do is designed to achieve that goal, to obey God, to bring about the well-being of other people ultimately in terms of spirituality and uh, the end of time, eternity. And so he goes ahead and talks about uh, corrupt communication. Verse 29, proper speech that will edify people and, and impart grace to hearers. And get rid of bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Verse 31, and be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. This is the work that Christians have to do. This is what we're to be about. This is why we're still in this life. And so we must be about the business of good works. Titus 2.14, he redeemed us from all iniquity and purified unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's what we're about. That's why Christ died for us. He talks about the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, Revelation 2 and 3. He says seven times, once to each church, he says, Jesus says, I know thy word. You get the impression then if Jesus were to walk through the door and look out over any given congregation of the Lord's people, what he's going to talk about, the subject matter is, how have you been behaving? What have you been doing with your life? What works have you been involved in? And so you get the idea then that our Christian existence has to do with works, activity, being active. In the Lord's work. And so Revelation 20, 12 through 13, at the end of time, the great judgment scene, we're going to stand before God and all human beings who have ever lived will be brought to account and judged according to their works. 
And didn't Paul say that in Romans chapter 2, verse 6? Also a judgment scene, at which time God, Christ, will render to every man according to his deeds. By the way, Romans 2, 6 is a quotation of Psalm 62, 12 and Proverbs 24, 12. And what about James chapter 2? There you see the trust, the embracing of God in our hearts and minds, beautifully blended, intimately interlinked with activity. And James makes clear in chapter 2, you don't have the works, your faith is dead, incomplete, vain, useless. There's a tremendous chapter on Christian behavior and how we're supposed to care about people who are in need in various ways. Why did Jesus come to earth? He takes us to John 17 at the end of Jesus' life or near the end of his life on earth. He said to God, I've glorified you on earth. I've finished the work which you gave me to do. How many people, even in the church, wandered into an awareness of what, it, of what is needed to become a Christian? So they became a Christian. It was sincere and legitimate. And now their life is just kind of sitting back and enjoying salvation. I'm a Christian. I've been saved. No clue that there's a work to do. If Jesus came to this life not to simply sit back and enjoy life and what God has done for us, but he had a work to do, a mission, a goal, an objective, a task, why would we think it would be any different for us? Servant's not above his master. And so when Jesus comes near the end of his life on earth, his trek in this world, he says, I did it. I've been busy and I've gotten the job done. May we all be able to say that when we come to the end of our earthly sojourn. He put it this way in John chapter 4, 31 and following, whenever his disciples became concerned, you need to eat, Christ. You need to eat some food. We're concerned about you. Remember his tremendous answer. I have meat or food to eat that you don't know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Is that our life, what Job called our necessary food? God's words and applying those words in our lives. And I li like Luke chapter 2. You remember every year Jesus' earthly parents would make their yearly annual journey to Jerusalem for the purpose of Passover. And uh, we're given this brief glimpse, this moment, when uh, 12 years into Jesus' life, they make this annual trek and they do their, what they're supposed to do and they apparently have a pretty fairly large entourage of family and friends, relatives. And uh, you remember how they gather up and they leave and they get a full day's journey away from Jerusalem. Some people don't think that's possible, but it is. I have four children. And I remember, uh, you know, with just four, I remember one time leaving one of our children at uh, Wendy's. We went in and ate at Wendy's and all got up and got loaded up in the van and and she came running out across the parking lot waving. She had gone to the restroom and nobody paid any attention. Another one fell asleep on a church pew up in it when I was preaching up in Illinois. And, uh, you know, everybody left and we went over some members' houses, uh, house to sing. And, and my wife was sitting across the living room and all of a sudden our eyes met. And I, I think I mouthed, Where's Jera? And uh, horror went through her eyes. And we ran out of that house and drove back to the building, pitch dark, unlocked the door, turned on the lights. She was still snoozing on the front pew. <clears throat> I believe that was at about the time that Johnny preached a meeting for us and had that effect. Uh... <clears throat> so it's not unusual for parents to overlook. And so here they leave their son. They get a day away from Jerusalem. It takes a day to get back. There's two days. And the Bible says it took them three to find him. So they spent a whole day looking around Jerusalem. And they finally come to this prominent place where here are these doctors of the law. And uh, do you remember what Mary said to him? You know, son, where have you been? Why have you done this to your father and I? We have been looking for you. The King James says, sorrowing. These parents were upset. They were panicked, concerned. And although the answer that Jesus gives is clearly one, uh, the statement that's made after he gives his answer is one that shows he was a submissive young man. He was not being disrespectful. But isn't it incredible what he said? He said, why, 
You know, why are you, why were you looking for me? Don't you understand that I have to be about my father's business? I would suggest to you that's a prototype for us. That's why we're in this life. We're supposed to be about our father's business. That's why we're here. To be Christ-like, that's what we have to be doing. And then in John chapter 4, this urgency. We've got a task to do. We need to get busy. There's too much to do for us to sit idly by. He said to his disciples, don't say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. You look around you right now, the, wheels are, the fields are white unto harvest. Man, that ought to light a fire under, under us and cause us. We don't have any time to dilly-dally. We need to get busy. There's too much going on. There are too many people lost. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, he saw the multitudes and was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad and, as sheep not having a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, the labors are few. Pray ye that the Lord of the harvest will send forth labors into the harvest. Brethren, do we feel that way? You know, a substantial portion of our brotherhood is poised and lunging off into apostasy. The rest of the United States is already lost. The rest of the world is. Five to six billion people. Can we not maintain a sense of urgency, borderline panic? You know, the illustration that was used by one of our speakers uh, was it Paul Sane when he rushed home because he thought his three children were in a burning home. That moment when he said that, no doubt all of us felt, I'll do anything, whatever I have to do, and I'll do it now. Doesn't the Lord want us to feel that way about the burning house of this planet? People dying every day, being ushered into eternity unprepared. Who is going to address that matter if it is not us? Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endued, but take to arm you for the fight the panoply of God. That's a good song that calls us to service. You know, in the military, uh, Brother Adam says, you've got people on active service and those that are not active. He says, in the army of the Lord, there's no such thing as inactive service. That never happens till you stop breathing. I don't care what age you are. I don't care if you're lying flat on your back with uh, no ability to operate your body from the neck down. Would you think, now, if anybody has a right to retire from the service of the Lord, that person would. I believe the Bible teaches as long as you can talk, then you have a responsibility in this life to reach out to other people with the gospel and to encourage and to help other people in their move toward heaven. So as soldiers of the Lord, we are to be on active status at all times. Preach the word, 2 Timothy 4. We've got to be properly briefed, understand the magnitude of the task. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. It's quite a task that lays before us. Our mar marching orders, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 and following, must ever be upon our lips. We've got to grasp the importance of time. Ephesians 5, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it's God's will that all men be saved. We recognize that the vast majority of people will choose not to be. The Bible teaches that. But we don't know who those few are out of that vast number. And so we have got to be about the business, dressing ourselves in the battle dress of the soldier of Christ, Ephesians 6, 11 and following, the uniform, and be about the business of trying to reach people with God's will. He then talks about why we're not doing that. 
He says, first of all, we live in an age of affluence. And he makes this statement. There has never been a spiritual giant produced in an age of affluence. I don't know if that's true. But I do know that the materialism of this country is killing us. It's destroying us. We have been overwhelmed by a deluge of material possessions. Our society is in a frenzied rush to possess more things, more wealth, more leisure time. And he says the result of that for us men has been that fathers have had their spiritual senses lulled and dulled and put to sleep. And therefore the influence for good that Christian men are to have is no longer in focus. We have become oblivious to the need for prioritizing in our lives those things of material and spiritual value. He says, in short, he, we have abdicated our spiritual responsibilities. We are asleep. He then explains how that has caused in the home a situation in which the wife has been forced into the role of spiritual leader in the home. He says what ultimately then has happened in society is women have not been able to bear that responsibility. And therefore they have been migrating out of the home into the workplace. Whether you agree with his assessment of that or not, you can certainly see a lot of that kind of thing happening. He uses one illustration about a well-dressed couple that comes into a toy store with their two children. Says, we want, we want some toys that will entertain our children. We work. Our children are alone a lot. We need something to really occupy their attention. And so the, the clerk shows them all kinds of things. He said, no, this won't do it. No, this won't do it. The lady started getting flustered. And finally the clerk said, ma'am, it seems to me what you need for your children is a mother and father. And we don't sell those here. How many times have you driven by Toys R Us over here on 820? And that lot is always full. I mean, it's full. And I've thought, what are parents doing? My impression is that in society today, people are showering their kids with all kinds of material trinkets that are of no value while shirking their responsibility to truly relate to the child spiritually and emotionally. Can you imagine uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you older folks, in your generation, can you imagine your parents running down to the toy store every day or two and get you something? Can you imagine that? <laughs> uh, you were happy at Christmas time if you got an apple, an orange, and uh, a few little trinkets, uh, maybe a piece of a stick of candy. You thought, man, this is great. And I found that generation didn't feel deprived either. Most of them didn't know they were poor. Life meant more because there were, there were values that were stressed. We've lost so much of that in American society and have replaced it with material things and our children are starving to death. No wonder our nation is in the, the fix that it is in. Christian fathers must set aside the necessary time to be with their children, to edify them. That's part of redeeming the time of Ephesians 5. We Christian men need to reevaluate then our lifestyle and establish spiritual values for ourselves and our family. And when we will do that, the potential for service will multiply. He talks about how hundreds of thousands of Christian men possess talents that ought to be used in the service of the master, Matthew chapter 25. But he says so many of them are burying those talents, Matthew 25, 25. And I might add, or using them in the service of work and and for the purpose of purchasing things, as James said in James uh, chapter 4, why are people out working to, uh, to get things to consume upon their lusts, to spend upon their pleasures? We've got a lot of talented people in the Lord's church. But how many of them are using those talents in direct connection with the work of the Lord? Every Christian man should listen to Jesus in Matthew 21, 28. Son, go work today in my vineyard. That's what God wants us to do. And not allow our talents to go unutilized, our abilities to be unused for the Lord. Three areas involved in the work of the Lord's church, evangelism, edification, benevolence. I don't know who came up with those three terms, if those are kind of gleaned from Ephesians 4 or what, 
But I think that that has been a good summary statement if we want to summarize the New Testament as to what Christians are to be doing. What we do falls into one of those three categories. He calls our attention to Austin Taylor's great hymn, the, the song leader that travels so often with Foy Wallace in his meetings. There's work for every Christian in the vineyard of the Lord. There's a work that you can do. He has given full directions for his servants in his word. There's a work that you can do. Little deeds, word of kindness, you can scatter everywhere. There are hearts of grief and sorrow. There are homes of want and care. You can tell the love of Jesus to a neighbor on the road. You can cheer a lonely brother. You can help him bear his love. You can sing a song for Jesus and his matchless love proclaim. You can live a life of honor. That will magnify his name. I like uh, Spencer's song. There is much to do. There's work on every hand. Hark, the cry for help comes ringing through the land. Jesus calls for reapers. I must active be. What wilt thou, O master? Here am I, send me. There's the plaintive cry of mourning, souls distressed. The sigh of hearts who seek but find no rest. These should have my love and tender sympathy. Ready at thy bidding. Here am I, send me. There are hungering souls who cry aloud for bread. With the bread of life, they're longing to be fed. Shall they starve and famish while a feast is free? I must be more faithful. Here am I, send me. There are souls who linger on the brink of woe. Lord, I must not, cannot bear to let them go. Let me go and tell them, brother, turn and flee. Master, I would save them. Here am I. Send me. We don't need to go across the ocean, across the country to do that. We are surrounded by people who need our attention. He talks about tools for evangelism. Time. We're going to have to take time. We're going to have to quit being caught up in the hustle and bustle, hurry, worry, helter, skelter of American civilization. We're going to have to take time to address the people around us. Teaching aids are available, he says. We need to be alert, be ready to every good work, Titus 3.1. In the area of edification, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, all things are to be done unto edifying. He goes back and talks about the Christian graces of 2 Peter 1. That that's edification when we add those to our lives and try to encourage those in other people. The Christian father needs to save his children by constant edification and example. Begin at home. Fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. Rule your own house well, having your children in subjection with all gravity. If you don't know how to do that, how can you take care of the house of the Lord, 1 Timothy 3. And so, before you can properly edify abroad, we Christian men need to have a closer responsibility with our own children. That's the work of the Lord. It begins at home and it begins constantly and daily. Deuteronomy 6, teaching. Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so as Christian men, fathers, husbands, we are to be directly and regularly involved in teaching our children the word of God. That demands time, attention. We need to edify by our example. Be thou an example of the believers. 1 Timothy 4.12. And he says, you know, a father's example before his children is a powerful influence I would suggest to you that it's more powerful than what the Father says to the children. Because you can preach to your kids. And yet they will see the hypocrisy and the inconsistency in your own life. And that will ultimately have a greater impact upon them. This was a good section. He says, children need to experience their father's enthusiastic leadership in attendance at Bible studies, Bible classes, worship services. They need to see and hear their father's positive support of elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, the preacher, and others. They must not be confused by a contradictory, pessimistic attitude on the part 
on his part that manifests itself in sour and critical remarks, complaining about every aspect of the work of the church. Isn't that good? The example set by the father, be it good or bad, will be one of the most powerful influences in the lives of his children. Then he moves to benevolence. Benevolence is not optional in God's word. Matthew chapter 25 gives us this great judgment scene. And while certainly this is not intended to be an exclusive description of what's going to take place at the judgment, nevertheless, surely we are impressed by the fact that of the five things that are brought up at the judgment, they all have to do with benevolence. Man, that ought to tell us something. We're to be a people who are concerned about the hungry, the poor, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, James 1.22. Benevolence is not optional. We need to give a cup of cold water, Matthew 10.42. He says when we do that, we adorn the doctrine of God, Titus 2.10. We ought, therefore, to be consciously alert to needs all around us regarding the necessities of life. I've just got to tell this real quick. Uh, Saturday, I was in the church building. Everyone had gone home after preparing the building for the lectureship, and uh, I was very busy, had a bunch of things to do, and people are constantly coming to, to the door, and that's why we have secretaries. And... Uh, I came down from upstairs and was rushing in my office, and just as I was about to go in the office, I looked through the glass door, and here come this fellow across the parking lot. And cold, you know, Saturday was cold, the wind blowing, and he looked kind of scruffy. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do here? <laughs> I've got a lot to do. He had a beard and his hat pulled down, and I went on in my office and was trying to finish up, and he, he pushed the buzzer. Bzzz, held it a good while. I kept doing what I was doing. There was one other man in the building. I thought, maybe he'll go deal with it. Waited a while. Bzzz, once again, so I go out there. And I go over to the door. You know, we've had intruders come in that one fellow came in and claimed to be the man of sin of Second Thessalonians. So I'm careful before I unlock that door. But um, <clears throat> I got up to the door, and it was Furman Curley. <laughs> I hadn't seen him in a beard. All the times I've seen him for 25 years, he hadn't had a beard, and it was Furman Curley. So... <clears throat> if I hadn't finally decided to be benevolent and to attend to someone's need, I guess Furman would still be standing out there in the cold. We need, therefore, Galatians 6.10 as we have opportunity. And I've noticed the older I get that the opportunities that I have to help people are not opportunities that are opportune for me. They're the very times when I least want to stop and deal with it. But the longer I live and the more I study these passages, the more I see that's exactly how God operates in this life. He wants us to stand back and get our perspective and see what really is important. Remember the statement? He was busy here and there, and he was gone. I wonder how busy here and there we are, and thus allow opportunities to leave us. Galatians 6.10, let's do good unto all men. Let's be involved. You might want to jot these down. These were listed by Maxi in the paragraph that he gave to the speakers. I thought this was good. Christianity is an active religion. It's not passive. The Lord wants us involved in his work. Every Christian needs to be challenged to think. That's what we need to do. We've studied through the New Testament. Now let's sit down and think how often we have been told what life is about, what we're to be spending our time doing. He gives these uh, examples. We can teach. We can pray, we can hand out tracts and other materials that teach the truth, we can invite people to come hear the gospel, either in our buildings, on television, on radio, we can grade Bible correspondence courses, we can arrange home Bible studies. You know, there's no, we used to say every Christian ought to be able to uh, teach the Bible to whomever they encounter. And then we said, well, even if you can't, you know, you can get somebody to come and help you or whatever. Well, there's no excuse now. We've got videotapes, audio tapes, things the first century did not have. There's not a single person, regardless of age, that couldn't take videotapes of good Bible sermons 
and take them to people and sit down and, and put it on there and you wouldn't even have to say anything. We don't have any excuse for not saturating the world around us with the Word of God. We can arrange home Bible studies. We can visit the aged, shut-ins, and sick, comfort the bereaved, lift up the downhearted, send cards. We can encourage. We can study. We can be faithful in every facet of Christian living, worship, and practice. I think those are good, solid descriptions of specific practical things that we ought to be doing. Let me call your attention to Job 31. Here is an entire chapter, 34 verses, where Job is trying to defend himself in terms of his religion. He's trying to say, I have lived a life before God that is in harmony with his will. So that ought to make us perk up. Even though it's Old Testament, we ought to look at the ingredients of a righteous life and see, you know, Job, what are you, what are you saying vindicates your life on a daily basis in God's sight? He gives eight things in Proverbs 31. Verses 1 through 12, he describes at length how he has not allowed his heart to be influenced by sex, illicit sexual desire. He's kept his thinking straight, his lusts in two, intact. He has kept his eyes from wandering. New Testament teaches that, doesn't it? Number two, verses uh, 13 through 15. He talks about the fellow workers, the employees, the men and man, uh, female servants under his charge. He says, I've treated them justly and kindly. That applies today, too. Verses 16 through 23. I've reached out to the poor, the widows, the orphans, the needy. He said, you show me one orphan boy that's within my sphere of influence, that's not wearing a sheepskin from my flock. He was a generous, benevolent man. He said there were widows that were downcast and disheartened. I made their heart sing. Verses 24 and 25, money. Job had a lot of it. But he refrained from covetousness. He did not allow his riches, his wealth, his money to get out of their proper place in God's scheme of things. In verses 26 through 28, he talks about, I didn't blow a kiss to the sun or the moon. He's talking about false religion. To be faithful and active and righteous today, to be workers in the kingdom, we must not allow ourselves to be influenced by false religion. Verses 26 through 28, uh, uh, sorry, 29 through 30, he loves his enemies. He didn't mistreat people, even though they deserved to be mistreated. You know, that reminds me of Jesus' words about saying rock on and harsh and bitter things toward people that are enemies of Christ. No, we're to treat them as a Christian should. Verses 31 and 32, he was hospitable. Very open and generous and, and assisting people in whatever their needs. And then in the last two verses, he was willing to openly admit his faults, confess personal sin without any fear of appearances. Let me call your attention now to three or four verses that I think kind of summarize and capsule what it means to be a worker for the Lord, to be active in the Lord's service. You're familiar with Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and, and what the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There are a number of these summary statements, Old and New Testament, that are all saying the same thing. We're to focus our lives on the specific instructions that God has given us for daily, active Christian behavior. Ecclesiastes 12 is certainly a, a clear one. When it's all said and done, scoping 12 chapters, every facet of human pursuit, health, wealth, youth, hard work, business, education, what's the conclusion? Fear God and keep his commands. This is the whole of man. French say, raison d'être, a reason for being. If you interview people all over this world, why are you here? What's your life about? What do you do? Very few would say that. The Bible says you are alive, you are conscious, you are breathing God's air for one reason. And that's to focus your life upon God's will on a daily basis. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 and following, Jesus said the same thing. 
When a fellow came and said, will you summarize the Bible for me? What's the, really the greatest commandment? Let's boil this thing down. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Seconds just like it. Leviticus 19, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. On this, the entire law and the prophets hang. Those two pegs. I'd say that's the way it is today, too. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you for listening.